Hello my friends, let's talk about Nier Automata, and specifically about the execution of feminist philosophy in the game. Now slow your roll, Mr. Man, I hear you say from the other side of the internet. How can a game that by default positions the camera for an occasional upskirt peek at the main character's famously large booty be a work of feminism? And that is fair. This game is rife with textbook definition male gaze, and as I explained in my previous analysis, the philosophy of Nier Automata Beta, more than a year ago, this game doesn't shy away from using sexuality as a metaphor for existential struggles. But let me give a short case before we really dig into the heart of this topic. First is that the game forces the player to think about the agency of 2B thanks to the animation where she forcibly swats away the camera and looks angrily at the player if the camera lingers at her skirt. Second is that around two-thirds, if not more, of the game's duration passes the Bechdel test, with the majority of the dialogue between female characters and almost none of it about male characters or their position in society as men, even going as far to present a short lesbian romance story on the part of 2B's operator 6O without any eroticism whatsoever. Third, while it is true that you can self-destruct in order to reveal 2B's bottom, the same is possible for our male protagonist 9S where you can detonate his shorts to reveal some boy thighs and skin-tight spats. So there is a little erotic fanservice for the ladies who like the yaoi fiction dynamic of the seme uke personalities. And 9S is definitely an uke. I will admit, after becoming so accustomed to seeing 2B's thighs whenever playing, moving around as 9S felt wrong if I didn't take a moment to give him <coughs> the same amount of liberty. Why do we have to wear undergarments? It's such a hassle. The records claim humans covered their crotches as they went about their business. Revealing one's genitals was seen as problematic. So just be quiet and wear them already. So all that said, I think it is fair to say that Nier Automata definitely has the equality of the sexes in mind. But the real heart of the matter lies within the first boss of the main quest of the game, Simone de Beauvoir. Simone de Beauvoir is a French existentialist philosopher of the 20th century. Though she was an accomplished existentialist in her own right, it is often joked that her work, The Ethics of Ambiguity, is the only way to understand her colleague Jean-Paul Sartre because of how impenetrable his existential writings were. Nier Automata even made this joke as Jean-Paul's side quest starts by the machine that floats next to him suggesting that if you want to understand what Jean-Paul is saying, that you should go talk to his followers instead. Simone de Beauvoir is more noted nowadays for her contributions to feminist political theory, though it seems that even education in feminist studies begins with the feminist mystique by Betty Friedan, who was influenced by the writings of Simone. In particular, de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, outlined a genealogy of feminist writings. If the feminist mystique is marked to be the animus to second wave feminism, then Simone and the Second Sex are the heart and soul of the first wave, made explicit and clear. Now there are a lot of different social commentaries and reasons for how they came about, not just for modern society, but societies throughout history. So we won't be looking at all of Simone's philosophy, but the aspect of which are relevant and presented in the game. Quote, one is not born a woman, but rather becomes one. End quote. By extrapolating from the best biological science at the time, de Beauvoir demonstrated that women and man's value cannot be determined by biology, but that socially constructed beliefs and economics affecting those changes in beliefs was significantly more impactful. She took Frederick Engels, co-author of the Communist Manifesto alongside Marx, to task for his assertion that the defeat of the female sex resulted from the invention of private property during the Bronze Age. This assertion was entirely baseless, and Simone criticized him for using no actual historical evidence to support the claim. Even the best scholarship of today shows that in many aspects of social roles throughout the very extensive hierarchy system of Bronze Age Egypt, women had a more egalitarian position than what we have in our current society. 
It is the culture that had Cleopatra, after all. Conversely, de Beauvoir showed how the creation of industrialization, women's subsequent entry into the workforce, and the invention of viable birth control were largely responsible for removing two factors of female oppression, economic dependence on men and the view of childbirth as a duty. Economic dependence, of course, meant not being able to take social action without a man's consent, and turning the act of childbirth into an ethical burden formed the basis of many further burdens placed on the role of women. Now, we already mentioned how Simone took down the biological argument, but it is worth noting that this is what de Beauvoir means when she says that a female person becomes a gendered woman through society. This long series of standards for women imposed forcefully by men creates a unique burden of femininity, whereas men are a neutral standard free to self-determine as they see fit. And this dynamic still reveals itself today in things like character design. Pac-Man is a disc with a mouth and an eye dot, but add a bow and suddenly Pac-Man is a woman. In Sonic the Hedgehog, every male character runs around naked, while most female characters are given dresses, skirts, or tops to engender modesty for those characters they decided to give breasts. Princess Sally being the exception to this rule in the Sonic lore, but that also demonstrates that engendering the character designs in the first place was unnecessary. But as a side note, modern intersectional feminism no longer holds this to be true, and recognizes a socially constructed burden of masculinity as limiting the freedom and self-determinism of men as well. This is what feminism refers to when they use the term toxic masculinity. We must remember, however, that Simone de Beauvoir is an existentialist. She argued that the human condition, regardless of gender, was defined by what she called the lack, that is, the lack of inherent meaning. Without such meaning or purpose, all that remains is the radical freedom described by Jean-Paul Sartre. But just like humanity itself, the machine life forms had no inherent burdens when they were connected to the machine network. They were a fully industrialized society, and thanks to the DLC, we see that they had some small measure of self-determinism, so long as they met the burden of devoting all of their labor to the machine network, but that's a topic for another time. No, in Nier Automata, the engendered norms came from the machine life form called Jean-Paul. In this game, Jean-Paul is kind of a jerk. He'll talk past you whenever you approach about his own ideas, ignore what anyone says in response, and regards any attempt at communication of some expression to be useless trash. This Jean-Paul does not care about dialogue or the other in any way yet he still rose to prominence in Pascal's village. Some machines wanted his respect and his attention, and thus in learning from the limited history the humans left behind, some machines saw the burdens of beauty created by femininity as a method used by humans to garner attention, but without that knowledge that there was no such need to garner such attention at all. Thus, the machines started to adorn themselves with the tokens of gender, recreate the social norms of gendered matrimony, and even instill the duties of sexual reproduction in the minds of machines that took on the role of children. Um, well, machines can't really make children. Neither can androids, now that I think about it. Uh, to be? Little help here? Huh? You're the chatty one. Work it out. Oof. Which was an aspect of de Beauvoir's commentary on how femininity is indoctrinated in young children as we limit what sort of play and interests are proper for girls by making them play with baby dolls or dictating how they should fold their legs when they sit. Such methods I saw firsthand when I worked as a teacher's aide in the public schools, so I can attest to its truth. But if it is such a proper representation of the gendered norms, how can we say that Nier Automata is a commentary of feminist philosophy and not just committing these same tropes found in other media? For one, there is the story of Simone the Machine Lifeform, 
whose pain and suffering in pursuing the misguided concept of gender norms resulted in mass atrocities committed against machine and android alike when she couldn't win the attention of Jean-Paul. And also that across all of the machine societies presented in this game, one factor remains true. Machine life forms do not fix or improve upon the flaws of humanity, but rather they repeat humanity's mistakes at an accelerated rate. And thus, despite the character of Simone not being fully represented as the deeply intellectual and influential existentialist that she was, the social and economic influences that expose the sensibility of her feminist philosophy were done their due justice. Yoko Taro's games have never shied away from discussing themes of sex and sexuality. They neither reject these weird impulses we have, nor leave them without scrutiny or commentary. Simone de Beauvoir is one of my favorite philosophers, and the prominence with which her philosophy is showcased in this game makes me appreciate it all the more. Thank you for watching, my friends. I decided to have a little contest for my near fans in this video. Attentive viewers will have noticed that at one point, Angelic script went across the screen. The first viewer who can translate all of the script and leave it in a comment below will get the opportunity to decide what philosopher in Near Automata I will be covering next. So make sure you comment with both your translation and your request. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel. There are new videos that come out every Saturday, so you don't want to miss it. Ring the notification bell so that you can get updates about when they publish. And if you could, hit the like button as well. The like button is the single most effective way this channel has right now of getting the video in front of other like-minded people who might be interested. So I really appreciate every person who takes the time to hit the like button. Thank you again, and remember, stay true.